Uh, you know, we've been in our little series. I don't know how long we'll go with this. We'll go till we feel like the Holy Spirit's finished with it. Well, we've been in a little series on uh, the apostolic and understanding what that really means. And I think God's given us some insight as we go. I hope you're uh, receiving a little bit from it. You know, I told you back in November when all of that thing happened here and uh, I was set apart in that in that role. I told you I'd explain to you as the days progressed a little bit more of my perception of it and what it means. So that's, we just have to cover the ground so we got an understanding. Amen. But sometimes people don't know and uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, I'm not sure that I fully understand all of it. I'll give you all I know, but I can't give you what I don't know. Amen. So we've talked to you about uh, apostolic ministry and what it looks like and what it is. We talked to you, did a sermon on that. We talked to you about, uh, you know, the apostle being the messenger of God. And there's a lot of ways you could interpret that as to what that actually means. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. Peter was an apostle to the to the Jews, and you see various ways that that ministry will work. And uh, then we talk to you about apostolic authority and what that means in the spirit realm a little bit. And uh, I'm sure there's even more that could be said about that, but we can just go as we go. But I want to talk to you today about do apostles and prophets exist today? Because there's a lot of debate in the church world about that, a lot of theological um, I think misunderstandings and a lot of people have theological positions on the fact, uh, on the fact do prophets and do apostles exist in the world today? Because I don't think that you can talk about the apostolic gift if you don't include somewhere in that the prophet because they're really a hand in glove type ministry. They go really together a great deal more than the others. And so... Sometimes if you don't believe one exists, you won't believe the other exists. And so that's kind of the way it goes. And in a great portion of the church world today, uh, there are whole large groups of people that don't believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And they don't believe in, uh, you know, they believe that there was an apostolic age. And when that apostolic age ended, then a lot of things ceased. We're going to cover that a little bit. Amen. We can't be exhaustive, but it's important that we touch it some. Amen? Because that does come up. Now we find over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we'll go down here to verse number 8. It says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. And whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now because of the way this is written right here, prophecies that they shall fail in tongues, they shall cease, then there are people who have concluded because of that, then the gifts of the Spirit that we find in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, those nine gifts of the Spirit that are mentioned, um, and, I, and I won't get into that, that's not the topic, but there are nine gifts of the Spirit, and that follows the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Once you're filled with the Holy Spirit, those gifts are available to you. That doesn't mean they'll ever work through you, but it does mean they're potentially there to work through you. But you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit before that happens. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, etc. But those gifts are mentioned in there. And again, there are nine of them, and you can study that uh, a little on your own if you'd like. But anyway, uh, charity never faileth, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, and whether there be tongues, they shall cease, and whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, you would think logically, if prophecies have failed, in other words, that's, that's over, and tongues have ceased, and that's over, then right in the same line of thought, knowledge has also vanished away. In other words, to pursue knowledge would be futile and pointless because... It couldn't exist if the others don't exist either. That would be the logical line of thought there. Would you think not? I mean, you know, it's just the way it works. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that, is, that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, in that line of thought where all these things have ceased, 
And there's a whole sessionist they, they, they believe that's, that's a name associated with people who believe it's ceased. They, they just believe it doesn't work or doesn't happen anymore. And uh, anyway, the logic behind that is this word perfect right here. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Their logic is the perfect is when the canon of Scripture was given and the New Testament canon was placed in our hands. And when the Bible was written and given to us, there's no longer any need for these things. And so therefore, from that point forward, it ceased to exist. And that is the logic behind what they say. When we got the Bible, that stopped. So the apostolic age stopped when we got the word of God. That's the logic in it. Now, we go on. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also am known. So the perfect that's mentioned here will happen according to scripture. According to my opinion, the perfect will come when we see face to face, not face to page. Amen. So it didn't stop when we got the Bible or the canon of scripture. It stops when we see Jesus face to face. That's the interpretation of the scripture. You know, now we can have theological positions that say all kinds of things, but you know, there's bad theology as well as there is good theology. <clears throat> you know what theology means, word theology. Theos means God and, and ology or uh, that combined word means the study of God. That's what theology is. Well, you can be a bad student and you can misinterpret. You follow me? Amen. So, uh, we have to rightly divide the word of truth. So the point is, I submit to you that that's not ceased, but it's still in operation today. And I believe that's what the biblical account teaches. Amen. And so they say that the gifts of the spirit only worked during the apostolic age. Therefore prophecies, that's why they failed. So they don't believe that prophets exist today. All right, so let's go forward a little bit. And we find in Luke chapter 16 and verse number 16. Now there's a person that I really admire greatly and I think they're one of the greatest preachers that ever drew breath. But I heard this originally from him as a position that he held. And I was really surprised of the uh, lack of understanding of scripture. And this is a person who's very, very prominent. Everybody would know the name. It wouldn't even be, you know, everybody would know the name. Um, it says the law, Luke 16, 16, then the law and the prophets were until John, since the time of the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. So his interpretation of, of that was prophets ceased with John the Baptist. And so from John the Baptist forward, there are no more prophets. No prophets exist. And that was his take on scripture. And I could, I could just completely rip that apart in about four minutes without even trying hard. I mean, that'd be no stretch whatsoever to tear that belief up. I mean, I wouldn't even, I, I mean, I wouldn't need a strong concordance to do that one. I could get that one real easy. You follow what I'm saying? But people believe it. And because they believe it, then they're bound to it. Amen. And so the conclusion was from this person's point of view and many others, I might say, um, the conclusion was that there were only prophets up until John the Baptist. And when he died, I guess the last prophet was living. Now we know that there were apostles after John the Baptist because <laughs> They were of the same era. 
you know, and, and those disciples that were there when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, that's what became the apostles. So again, it's just illogical thought, really. It doesn't make any sense. Amen. And so, uh, since there are no more prophets, I guess shortly thereafter, there would certainly be no more apostles. Amen. Now we look over here in Hebrews chapter one. Now I'm going to go through a little uh, stuff today. I don't want it to be tedious, but I want it to be informative to you and maybe uh, helpful. Now, again, the question is in this sermon, do prophets and apostles exist today? You know, so many people believe that there were 12 apostles and there are no more. There were the 12, and when the last one died, all the stuff, the healings, the miracles, all the stuff, it all stopped right then. There are people who believe that, all right? Now, they believe that God can do anything, but they just believe that, you know, it's not anything you should, you, you should expect, and it's not anything that could be normal in the body life of believers. Amen? Are you home? So let's look at it a little bit and let's go through uh, the scripture and see if there were only 12 apostles. How about that? Won't this be fun? See, I can't wait. Poke your neighbor. Say, now wake up. Because this is good. Tell them that. Just tell them this will be really good. All right. Now we find here in Hebrews chapter three, verse number one, it says, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. So the first apostle mentioned in the Bible ever is Jesus Christ. So that kind of hurts the 12 theory right off the bat because Jesus was an apostle. Now, ministry, I don't care what it is, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, all of those emanate from the head of the church. Jesus is the embodiment of all those. He's the great shepherd. He has under shepherds, pastors. Amen. He was a, the great teacher. He has teachers that teach in his stead. While he's seated at the right hand of the father, he appointed teachers to do the work while he's away. Amen. So all the elements of Jesus' ministry are embodied somehow in those that he's appointed to do his work. The anointing of God is on them to do his work in his physical absence. Now he lives among us by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's not absent, but he's not physically present. Amen. 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 All right. So Jesus is the first apostle mentioned in the Bible. Then we go over here to Matthew chapter 10 and we'll go down here to verse number one in Matthew 10 and one, it says, and when he had called unto him, his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now these 12 disciples or what became the apostles. Amen. Now, before they were apostles, they were disciples. Amen. Now, a disciple is a disciplined follower of Jesus Christ. To be a disciple of the Lord, it requires discipline. Amen. So we have to do certain things in certain ways. But he goes on to say, and the names of the 12 apostles are these, first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. So Jesus is okay with nepotism. He's a family recruiter. All right. So here we have Peter and Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. So we got two sets of brothers in the 12 right away. All right. Now, if you notice, James, the son of Zebedee, that's important. He's drawn a distinction. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, 
James, the son of Alphaeus. So we have James, the son of Zebedee, and now we have James, the son of Alphaeus. So we have two James that are of the apostles. Now it's important that you remember that because we're going to get back to James in a little while. All right. We're going to make another reference to James. All right. So he draws a distinction. And usually when you hear, uh, you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, Peter, James, and John, that James that's mentioned there is uh, the son of Zebedee. Okay. That's important. But sometimes you'll read the scripture and you'll see a reference to James and we think it's always the same James being referred to. But it's not necessarily. You got to draw some distinction. Amen. amen. I said amen. amen. And uh, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the publican James, the son of Alphaeus and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So those are the 12 mentioned right there. These 12, Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into the city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. Now, it, it notice here, it says, and Jesus sent them forth. They were sent forth by Jesus. Now remember, in defining what an apostle is, one of the definitions of an apostle is a sent one, one sent forth on a specific mission for a specific reason as a messenger of God for a specific cause. Amen. And so these were sent forth with a specific mission from Jesus Christ himself. And if Jesus calls apostles today, it's the same type of commission, not in the same, um, at the same level these were, but there are Apostles at various levels. Now these are what are referred to in scripture as the apostles of the lamb. Now you find basically, and in, in, in this would, this is a very, very narrow uh, way of looking at it because it's much, much broader than what I'm going to say. But there are three main categories of apostles mentioned in scripture. The apostles of the lamb that's what we see here. We also have what we refer to as foundational apostles. You remember they said we don't build, uh, we build on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So there are certain apostles that were foundational. We'll, we'll open that up a little bit as we go further. And then you have other types of uh, apostles. But there are these two high categories are apostles of the Lamb and foundational apostles. Amen. Amen. And again, you'll understand that a little bit more as we make progress through here. So the apostles of the Lamb, they will not be added to, they will not be taken away from throughout eternity. In heaven, they're still the apostles of the Lamb. They'll never stop being that. And any apostle that would come later will never enter that category. So in one sense of the word where you hear people say, well, the age of the apostle has passed away. In a sense, there's some truth to that. If you're talking about the apostles of the lamb. So there's some validity to that, but it's not fully valid. Amen. You, you follow, you're tracking with me. All right. So uh, apostles have specific assignments. They're apostles to certain geographical regions. We talked to you about that when we talked to you about um, apostolic authority. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. Peter was an apostle to the Jews. That's specific authority unique to what they did in their assignment. There were certain ones that were given certain words to take to certain people. And so they had a, they had a, a, maybe a geographical authority that they wouldn't have everywhere. You follow? Paul said, if I'm not an apostle to others, yea, doubtless I am to you. So I have a unique authority with you that I don't have with everybody. That's important. Apostolic authority is not universal. 
Because a person's an apostle doesn't make them an apostle to everybody. Now, Jesus is. He's the absolute authority. But anybody who serves under him, we know in part, they have a part of Jesus' ministry. They don't have it all. They have a part. Amen. And of that, we make up the whole. We are the body of Christ. So we make up the whole by putting our parts together and in operation. You have a part. I have a part. All God's children got a part. (laughs) Amen. Praise God. And so there are some that have authority in geographical regions. There are some that have uh, anointing and authority in certain people groups. Some have it over a certain type of ministry. I've heard Smith Wigglesworth referred to as an apostle of the anointing or apostle of faith. I've heard others referred to as an apostle. I, 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 believe, that, uh, I believe that Dr. Avanzini is an apostle of finance. I really believe that. I think, and you see, you understand it. And he can take that authority when he's in that arena. He can take that all over where people will receive it. So it's not unique to geography. It's unique to heart and the people who have a heart to hear it and receive it. You follow me? So those are very important things. And so an apostle can be a number of different things and they can minister in a number of different ways. Now we find over here, <clears throat> and so what we've got mentioned and what we just mentioned gives us 13 apostles. Say 13. 13. Now if you count Jesus. Okay, so you got the 12 and you got Jesus. Now you go to Acts chapter 1. And down to verse number 16, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spoke before concerning Judas, which was God to them that took Jesus, for he was numbered with us and had obtained a part of this ministry. So some have suggested <clears throat> that Judas was not a legitimate apostle, but according to scripture, he was. He said he had a part of this ministry. And he was numbered with us. So he was anointed to be an apostle. According to scripture. Not according to opinion. Because there's all kinds of opinions that float around. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. And falling headlong he burst asunder in the midst. And all the bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all of the dwellers at Jerusalem in so much that the field is called in the proper name of Seldomah, which is to say the field of blood. And, and I won't get into that story deep because I never get out of the weeds and I need to finish today. <laughs> today. <laughs> For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate. In other words, don't live in his house. In other words, th- there's such a violation in the spirit, don't even move into Judas's house. One translation says his house was haunted. It actually says that. I thought, no, that's interesting. Probably was. I guarantee it had a devil living in it. There's only two people in the whole of scripture that were ever possessed with the devil, not a spirit, a demon. The only two mentioned in scripture are Judas and the Antichrist. That's it. That's a bad situation to have going on in it. And uh, it says, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and no man dwell therein in his bishopric, let another take. Now the word bishopric there means his leadership or his position of authority, which we know was apostolic. So when it says he lost his apostolic authority, that's what it's talking about because of his betrayal of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I said, amen. Amen. Wherefore of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, uh, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Now, what you find in verse 21 and 22 is 
the qualification necessary to being an apostle of the Lamb. That's what it gives you right there. It gives you certain qualifications that are necessary if a person was going to be an apostle of the Lamb. They had to, uh, they had to have accompanied with us the whole time. Now, when Jesus was moving about and going to and fro in his ministry, of course the 12 were with him. They were the closest. But there were other groups that followed him all the time because it tells us here that there had to be to do that. It says they had to company with us all the time. So there were others that were in the company all the time. And it says that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of John. So they had to have been there right from the very beginning when John baptized Jesus. They couldn't have come in a week later, a month later. They had to have been there from day one to qualify as an apostle of the Lamb. A little ahead of myself, but that is why Paul could not possibly be an apostle of the Lamb. Because many people believe that Paul was the replacement for Judas. Not possible. Because he didn't qualify. He did not qualify for that. Amen. Amen. So they had to be there from the baptism of John under the same day which he was taken up. So they not only had to start with him, they had to stay with him until he was taken up into heaven. They had to go through the whole three and a half years of Jesus' ministry. They couldn't leave early. And it goes on to say, and must be one ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So they not only had to be there from the baptism of John, they had to be there at his ascension to heaven, but they had to be there when he was resurrected from the dead. They had to see the whole show, all of it to qualify. Amen. And that's why Paul obviously could not qualify. And they appointed two. Now remember they're in the upper room it's just before Pentecost happens. It's just before the whole group, the veil of the temple was rent in twain and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues in Acts chapter two. They're in the upper room just before this happens. This is what's going on. Amen? Amen? Amen. Is this informative? I think it is. And they appointed to Joseph called Barsabas who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, show us whether these two thou hast chosen, that they may take part of this ministry and apostleship. So right now they're selecting the next apostle to take the place of Judas. That they may take part of this ministry and this apostleship. Right? And to, the qualification was you had to be there for the whole thing before you're even in the category of possibility of selection. And they chose two out of the group. And one was named uh, Joseph, called Barsalus, and the other uh, surnamed Justice and Matthias. In verse 25, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots. Now they cast lots. Now remember something about casting lots. They cast lots. There's a number of things that used to be allowable in hearing from God that is now no longer allowable. One of the things was laying out a fleece. You remember how they laid out a fleece and it became moist on one side and then, you know, that. People still do it today, but it's totally unscriptural under the new covenant. Totally unscriptural. So anyway, that's one thing that people still sometimes do, but it was allowable in that case. It worked. Then there was the Urim and Thummim. I don't know if you've ever read the Urim and Thummim, but those were the, the, the jewels that were on the, the, the breastplate of the high priest. And those things would change colors. and They would indicate what the will of God was. You know, so there were ways the prophets in the old Testament were used by God 
to give the will of God to the people. That is the difference between a New Testament and an Old Testament prophet. That is not allowable in the New Testament. I'm giving you some real good information. I promise you. That's the difference. Now, will God use a New Testament prophet to tell you maybe something he wants you to? Certainly. But you don't seek it. You don't go to the prophet to learn the will of God. The reason being, well, let me read. And he gave forth their lots and the lot fell upon Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So here we have the selection of the next apostle of the Lamb. Now the reason that you don't do these things under the new covenant is because just a few verses after this event, this is the end of chapter one. At the beginning of chapter two, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The veil of the temple was rent in twain and the guide came to live in you. And now you don't seek guidance outside, you seek it inside. That's why it was allowable then and not allowable now. If you didn't get anything today, you got that. And you needed that. That'd take a lot of weariness off of a whole bunch of you. You need to start quit seeking and start listening. <laughs> you have a God within you. You have one in you. Amen. And that's what God wants you to live by. You're led by the Spirit. Amen. Thank God. Amen. So here we have Matthias. As far as the apostles, he was number 14. Everybody say 14. Now we go over here to Acts 13. Are you learning anything? I won't keep you here all day, but I might keep you here half a day. I mean, what do you think? Acts 13, verse number one. Now there was in the church, which is Antioch, certain prophets and teachers... Okay, so we have prophets right here. Now, you remember we read earlier, you know, those that said the prophecies or prophets stopped with John the Baptist. What you going to do with that one? It was a long time after John the Baptist was off the scene with this. He'd already been beheaded. He's already in heaven. And we have prophets, according to Scripture. Now, there were at the, in the Church at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, which is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Ghost said, the Holy Ghost said, led by the Spirit. Amen. Say amen. Amen. Uh -huh. The Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work we're into, I've called them. So Saul and Barnabas or Paul and Barnabas, that's Saul, Paul to become Paul. They were either prophets and teachers or prophets or teachers already. Because they were in that category of these men that were mentioned here. And they were in that category. And it says when they had prayed and fasted, they laid their hands on them and sent an apostle is a sent one, and they sent them away. We find in chapter 14, verse number 14, and when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul. So we see right now when they were sent away, they were sent away to take on the office of the apostle. They were already prophets and teachers, but now they were promoted to the office of the apostle. Are you home? Are you learning anything? Are you bored? No. Well, don't act like it. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> the apostles, 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 Barnabas and Paul. So here we have 15 and 16. 12 apostles? I don't think so. Because this is 15 and 16. Now Romans 16, verse number seven. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles 
who, were also, who also were in Christ before me. So here we have Adronicus and Junia, which were of note among the apostles. So Adronicus and Junia were apostles. What about that? Now you want me to tell you something more interesting? Junia is a woman. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> All the women should have at least said amen. <laughs> amen. Well, it's, it's, I think it's interesting stuff. I do. Because we are so, we are so unknowledgeable about things we ought to be knowledgeable about. You know, we perpetuate our ignorance because we accept things without looking at what the scripture says. You know, we just do it. Now we find here in Galatians chapter one, verse number 19, but other of the apostles saw I none save, now listen, James, the Lord's brother. So we now have a third James. That's not a book in the Bible. That's the third James. Okay. So here we have James of Alphaeus. We had, we had James, our son of Alphaeus, James, the son of uh, Zebedee. And now we have James, the brother of Jesus. Now he's the one that wrote the book of James. James, the brother of Jesus. So you can get all that, you can let all that run together, but it's, it's, I think it's noteworthy. So here we have, now Paul, uh, Paul's the one speaking, and, and what he was doing, he was making sure about his ministry, and he said, uh, and he said, none of the other apostles saw I except James, the Lord's brother. So there were other apostles, but he pointed out James, the Lord's brother, as an apostle. Amen. So here we have James, the Lord brother, the Lord's brother, as number 19 in the revelation of the apostles. You ever heard teaching like this? It's good. Isn't it? I mean, it is good. I mean, now we go over here to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. In verse number 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of Thessalonica. Thessalonians, which is in God, the Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace, peace, and on and on. But if you'll notice, the three mentioned here are Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus. Now, Silvanus is Silas. That's who it is. And Timotheus is Timothy. You wouldn't have any trouble understanding Timothy from Timotheus, but you might not pick up Silas out of Silvanus. But anyway, that's who it's referring to here. Now he goes on over in the same book in chapter two, and he gives a little more clarity about these three. He said in 1 Thessalonians 2, 6, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome. Now he's, he's, he's referring back to them. That's what he's doing. He's making reference back to them. They wrote the book, they sent it. And he said, nor of men sought we glory. We didn't seek any glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. So here we find Silas and Timothy are called apostles. Twelve apostles? Hmm. Gets to be a problem, doesn't it? So now we got 20 and 21. All this is scriptural. It's coming from the B-I-B-L-E. <laughs> Amen. Now we find here in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 25, yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Now you remember when we talked about partnership last week, Epaphroditus was the, was the courier between Paul and the church at Philippi. When when the, when the Philippian believers would support Paul, Epaphroditus was the one going there and carrying the, the funding back to Paul for the ministry. Amen. So he was a courier in a sense. And I say those things certainly just to draw attention to his responsibilities. 
So he was an apostle, but he was doing the work of a courier. He was going in between. Amen. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. Now the word messenger there is the word translated in the Greek apostolos, which is apostle. So Epaphroditus was an apostle. According to scripture, some translations just translate it that way. They just say, I don't have time to go through all the translations because I never get this taught. You follow me? But it, believe me, it really is. And so uh, here we have number 22. Amen. Now we find here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Y'all okay? Punch your neighbor and say, I'm okay. Are you? Tell them that. All right. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 6, and these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself into Apollos for your sake, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, written that no one of you be puffed up one against another. Now you could read the in-between, but let's just go to verse number 9 for time's sake. I'm trying to squeeze and condense and give you the thought. For I think that God has set forth us now, who was he referring to? Him and Apollos. God has set forth us as the apostles. So he called Apollos an apostle. Amen. I said amen. amen. So Apollos is number 23. 12 apostles? I don't think so. Kind of does away with the age of the apostles a little bit. Wouldn't you think? Mm-hmm, I would. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 23. Whether do any inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you or our brethren be inquired of. They are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Now here we have, of course, Titus is mentioned, but it mentions specifically the uh, brethren. Now, uh, the Amplified Bible says two brethren. Now, we know it's more than one because it calls them brethren, not brother, brethren. So there's at least two mentioned here. Would you agree? And so the Amplified Bible says two. It says it point blank, just says two, two brethren. And then it goes down here. These two brethren are called the messengers of the churches. Now, the word messenger right there, again, is apostolos, which is apostle. And some translations, again, translate it that way. And I could give you all these, but I don't have time. And you can look it up. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a mystery. You can look it up once you have the reference. You can, you can do the work from that point forward. So here we have two unnamed men, brethren, mentioned as apostles. So here you have two unnamed apostles as well as those we've seen. Amen. So th this is number 24 and number 25. Unnamed apostles. Amen. Now you have possible apostles mentioned in scripture. Now what is a, poss a possible apostle? I'll show you as we look a little deeper. Jude, who wrote a book of the Bible, he is not called an apostle, but he wrote a book of the Bible. So if you believe that Jude is an apostle, now you have number 26. Now I'd say it'd be a safe bet to call Jude an apostle. I don't think you'd be stretching the scripture any. Because a lot of the way we interpret scripture is about pattern. What did apostles do? They wrote books of the Bible. So I think he would fall into that category, wouldn't you? So he's not called an apostle, but if he is an apostle, he's number 26. We have Mark, who wrote the book of Mark. He's not called an apostle, but I would dare say somebody that wrote a gospel 
account of the Lord Jesus, I would think he would be an apostle. You just think that's a safe bet. Okay. So if Mark is an apostle, we have number 27. Then we have Luke. Now Luke wrote the book of Luke. He also wrote the book of Acts. Luke, the beloved physician. He is not called an apostle. But I'd say he'd qualify. Wouldn't you? Mm Mm-hmm. So here we have number 28. Now we have Titus, who had a similar ministry and a similar role to Timothy. They were parallel ministries. Titus is not called an apostle, but he did the same work that an apostle did, Timothy. So if you would call Titus an apostle, now you have 29. Amen. 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 You're going to seminary, aren't you? Mm -hmm. You're being taught. 1 Corinthians 15, 7. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. So it says all the apostles makes reference to at least one more, at least one more unnamed apostle. At least one more. So what we have is, I believe, the New Testament teaches 30 apostles mentioned in Scripture. I don't think it passed away. The 12, that did. The foundational or the the apostles of the Lamb, that will never be added to. But the ministry of the apostle continues to live on. And it continues to live on today as well as it lived through the early church. Now we find in Ephesians chapter 4. And with, this is a reference to Jesus. Verse number 8. Wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. This is Jesus' ascension. And when he left, he gave gifts unto men. And he goes on to tell us what those gifts are in verse 11. And he gave, the gifts that he gave are some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. So when Jesus ascended on high and left gifts among men, one of those gifts that he left is the apostle and another is the prophet. So those gifts Jesus left with us for a purpose. And the purpose is found in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all come into the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man or mature man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we hence bore uh, no more be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness where they will lie and wait to deceive. So these things that perfect the saints, mature the saints, protect them from deception, bring them to a place of, 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 of good service to the Lord where it actually is meaningful service. That takes place by the appointment of these gifts that he left us. Without those gifts, then evidently these things can't happen. You're not left to your own devices. You're not left to just figure it out. You're given instruction from the head of the church by people he leaves behind and appoints for the work of the ministry to teach us how to do the things that we've been called and set apart to do and to keep us out of the ditches that we get in without it. That's why the apostolic ministry is necessary as well as the others. But that's what we're focusing in on today because it's the one that you can't talk about because a lot of people don't even believe it exists. Well, how are we going to have it if we don't believe it exists? That's a travesty. And do you see what price we're paying for it? We know in part. See, we, if we don't have our parts in place, then we've got to void And that's exactly what the devil wants you to have. A void. Not complete because we don't acknowledge what God is doing. And we all suffer because of it. Amen. I mean, it's critical. So I think that you could say since these things are why he left 
these gifts behind, you know, uh, and I could read on and on. I probably do need to read a little bit more. But anyway, I think it's fairly safe to say with these things being as critical as they are and till we all come into the unity of the faith, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, I don't think we're quite there. Do you? I would say these offices are still intact. And I'd say they're still in place today because folks, we've not graduated to that level yet. And he said, until these things happen, these offices will be in place. I don't know if there will be apostles in heaven. I know the apostles of the lamb will be. I don't know what their role will be. And I'm sure every person who serves God on this earth will go to heaven and, and serve him there too. I don't know what their job will be. Do we have church in heaven? I don't know. Boy, can you imagine the singing there? Woo, be all right, won't it? You know, I mean, really, if you think about it, I, mean, I think heaven's going to look a lot like earth, but it'll be a lot better. You know, I think the things we enjoy here, we'll enjoy there. You'll know as you're known. You know me here, you know me there. You think we'll know one another in heaven? Didn't Eric Clapton write a song like that? He did. You know, it's after he lost his son that he wrote that song. Will I know you in heaven? And that was an inquiry from a hurting heart that asked that question. I don't make a lot of that. That's a legitimate question. And the answer is, yes, you will know him there. You got to go first. I'm not casting any shade anywhere. I'm just saying, you know, you got to make sure that you go. But, you know, so I think it's safe to say that we need these things in place today. And the church suffers greatly because it doesn't have it. And we see in chapter 16 or verse 16 of Ephesians 4, he said, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working of the measure, measure of every part, maketh the increase of the body unto the, the edifying of itself in love. Now, if you di dissect that a little bit, you know, you ever heard that old song? Knee bones connect to the shin bone. You ever read that, heard that? Okay. I don't know if that's the way it actually is, but it's something like that. But the principles there, I guarantee you, you know, the, the forearm is connected to the upper arm by a little thing called the elbow. What is the elbow? I mean, it's not a trick question. What is your elbow? It's a joint? Really? Oh, let's read the verse again. From whom the whole body fitly joined, joint, joined together. So your joint, now listen to what your joint does. Hmm. And compacted that which every joint supplieth. Now God has a supply process for you. Heaven wants to supply you with information, with blessing, with contribution into your spiritual walk to bring you into the place that he has for you. And when you're disjointed, you have no supply. Oh, it doesn't matter if you go to church. Oh, I see disjointed. Doesn't matter to you. Therefore, you're not adequately supplied. Because the joint is the supply. Well, I can get it on my own. That's not what the scripture says. He said, you get it by the joining. Look at, look at your neighbor, poke him a little bit. And say, can I come over to your joint tonight? Tell him. <laughs> See, our hanging out together is what gives us the ability to overcome. But he put that into context of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. So if you don't have the apostle's ministry working in your life, you're not adequately supplied. You got something you need that you just can't get. 
You need something, and it's just not there. Well, what's missing? How do you know what's missing when you don't know? You don't know what's missing is the problem. You want me to tell you, you want me to give you the good word or the easy to understand word? That won't be the friendly word, but it's the easy to understand one. You're ignorant. Did you call me ignorant? Yeah. If you're not supplied. See, we're all ignorant when we're not supplied. But the problem is we don't know what the supply is. <laughs> You know, there's a, there's a big revelation when you understand you're ignorant. The problem is, is we're ignorant and don't know it. Waking up to your ignorance is a huge step forward. You ever heard too dumb to know you're dumb? I'm not calling names, I'm just saying. It's a principle. Kids. Why do I have to mind? Because I'm the parent. That's why you just have to do what I tell you to do. Why? You can't reason with a kid because why? They're too dumb to know they're dumb. <laughs> they ain't going to figure it out. You can't analyze it. Just do it. Because I'm the dad. That's why. Enough said. You know, and that's the way to a degree God has to treat us when we became a man, we put away childish things. We quit acting like that and we listen. Amen. So when we grow up, we got to listen. And so the body of Christ needs supply. And the supply, now really I could say all these things. But we're talking about the apostle. So we got to put the emphasis where our subject matter is. When the apostles' ministry is not allowed in the church by acknowledgement and acceptance, we live ignorantly and don't know it. We're suffering in ways we shouldn't suffer. We're not receiving the supply from heaven that we ought to supply, be supplied with, and we don't even know we don't have it because we've not allowed it. That's the truth. That is the absolute truth. Amen. Now, we see in 1 Corinthians 12, I, I know I'll quit eventually. I'll stop some point in time. They threw my clock away, so I'm, I'm wide open. <laughs> James took my clock. He said, he said Pastor, you, you just go forever. That's what James, Nora's, Nora's saying she's got me timed here, so I'm shut up. Would you just shut up? <laughs> I know how Adam felt. <laughs> this woman you've given me, Lord. Okay. First um, Corinthians twelve eighteen. But now hath God set. Everybody say set. set. Okay. Set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased Him. So there, there are people that are set in the body. Gifts are set in the body. The Lord sets in the body. He leaves gifts among men. Okay. And, uh, you know, in verse 21, and the eye can't say of the hand, I have no need of you. Hmm. Nor can the head to the feet say, I have no need of you. In other words, it's, it goes to that forearm and elbow connection. I can't say I don't need you because if I don't have you, I'm not supplied. Hmm. Wow. That's pretty serious, isn't it? Now, for time's sake, we'll skip down here to verse uh, 27. Now, you are the body of Christ and members in particular. So everybody has a particular place in the body set by God for them that the body needs. Amen. And God hath, who? God hath set. In the church, now listen to this one, first apostles. The first set office in the church is that of the apostle. Why do you think the devil would try to tell you it doesn't exist today? <laughs> to keep you not supplied. 
You cut off your supply. Because you have to walk in these, you have to not only walk in these offices by faith, you have to receive them by faith. Because it's faith that receives from God. Amen. So if we fail to acknowledge, see, see, my, my argument was, you know, okay, God's calling me into the apostolic ministry. My argument was, Lord, I'm doing it anyway. Because all the boxes were already checked. It wasn't, it wasn't trying to do something else to qualify. It was already all there. I said, why can't I just be a pastor and be nice? He said, because that's not what I said you are. I remember my mother used to come out on the back porch when I'd be out in the field playing baseball and all that stuff with the boys, the guys, kids in the community. And she'd yell, hey, Eddie. Now, I knew it was supper time. Why? Because she called me by my name. God stood on his back porch in heaven and called, hey, apostle, what you going to answer to? You going to respond or you going to rebel? You can't get from God what you're unwilling to receive from God. So I have to humble myself and accept it. Against my will, not against the will of God in my life, but against my natural will, yes. Because I don't like, <laughs> you get enough. If you say you're a pastor, that's enough. If you say you're a prophet, that's enough. If you say you're an apostle, that's something else now. Because you think the devil's going to lay down for that? He'd certainly try to ridicule it. And I guarantee he'd try to talk you out of it too. And tell you it's not important, doesn't matter, just do the work anyway, it doesn't matter. But God told me, I'll tell you what, exactly what he said. He said, I can't reward you as an apostle if you won't accept it. I said, well, accept it. We'll do it. And you have to do it publicly because everybody's got to buy it. Or you won't get it either. Well, we don't need all that. We don't need the titles. That's just titles. It's not a title if God called you that. It's rebellion if he called you that and you won't accept it. Are you home? Yes. Now, see, there's a thing that I believe is going on, and we're kind of summing up here. We're getting to the punchline now. Okay. See, I don't know about you, but I believe Jesus is coming soon. I really believe right away the trump's going to sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air. I believe that's coming. I believe it's, I believe it's so close we can almost feel it. This whole world is not going to, not going to take much more of what's going on in it. Jesus is coming. But one of the things that Jesus is coming we find in Ephesians chapter 5. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of the water by the word. Now that's a reference to the church. And he goes on to say that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So Jesus is coming for a church that's glorious with no missing parts and properly supplied and fully walking in what he called us to do. You can't do it without the apostolic ministry being restored to the body. And what we're doing right now is as prophetic as the sun coming up in the morning. It's not just something we chose to do. It's something we must do for the perfecting of the body for the glorious church that he's coming for. God help us understand this. It's not a toy. It's critical. This is an apostolic house. That's the mantle on it. That's what's coming. 
It's going to affect you, your family, your day-to-day -day routines. It's going to affect your career. It's going to affect your understanding, your revelation, your insight, your enunciation. It's going to affect everything about you because you bought it. And by faith, it's coming. Well, won't you understand there's a great blessing on this? Now, we might be a little ahead of the curve, not fully. I mean, there's others. But this is not common. But this is God's will. And do you see the necessity of it? It's so important, guys.